it, it may sound very simple, but it's extremely hard to pull off. And that, that really is the art of storytelling. Right. With, with, any, with any pitch, some pitches might overly celebrate the technology or the intellectual property that they sort of have a, a, a toehold on. And uh, so sometimes the story about how that's actually going to transform someone's experience is, is, is lacking. Hello and welcome to the AOU podcast, Entrepreneur Leadership in Africa, where we explore more on being a bold entrepreneur leader. I'm your host, Savannah Olo, and today I have with me Kevin Bethune. Kevin is a CCO and co-founder of Dreams Design and Life, started in 2018. He is an engineer by background and a designer by heart, as you'll hear in today's episode. He has been a part of some amazing projects. For our sneak enthusiasts, he was part of the design team for the Air Jordan Fusion 8. Today, we discuss human-centered design thinking to solve global challenges. You'll realize that in more ways than one, the path you choose will most times align with your passion at some point. Do you know the big misconceptions about the design industry? Well, stay tuned and know it all. Join us as we uncover a whole new world from our diverse community of entrepreneurial leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Kevin Bethune. So, Kevin, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be part of the AOU podcast. Oh, uh, no, thank you for having me. Honored by your invitation. <laughs> thank you so much. So, to kick off this episode, um, a small icebreaker, what have you. Um, I, usually, I, I haven't done this commonly with the, with the guests that I have, but I really feel like, you know, to make you feel at home, we need to know a bit more about how you think, yeah. So... What is one food you'll never have a taste for? (laughs) Um, I think that would be uh, uni or sea urchin. What? That's such a random food. (laughs) Why? (laughs) I I think I I tried it a couple times and I've always had an adverse reaction. Right. Whenever I'm having Japanese cuisine with friends, that's the one dish I can't have. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, great. All right, then. So let's, let's get straight into the episode. So given your experience and expertise, you're an engineer by training and a designer by profession. Why do you choose to go down that path of strategic and industrial design as opposed to applying your mechanical engineering skills? Uh, That's a good question. Uh, Honestly, when I started my career, I I didn't know much about design. It it very much fell sort of in the abstract arena, like under art almost. Um, At least that's what I perceived at the time. Right. and, and w- because my intersections also spanned into science and mathematics, uh, I felt engineering was per- perhaps the more pragmatic right. uh, first step in the career. But I think it was when I arrived at Nike uh, later uh, to, to uh, continue my, my uh, career that I was exposed to design professionally for the first time. And I just became immensely curious. And design honestly builds on... Um, some foundations that are shared with mechanical engineering. So it was a nice, uh, happy medium. Right, great. So would you tell us the biggest misconception or myth when it comes to working in the design industry? Um, I think for, for, the, for the large part, most, most professionals, uh, most businesses, I think still perceive design to be the last step in any value chain. Um, there's sort of the stereotypical soundbite of, oh, we just need the designer to come in to make a logo or um, make the final sort of idea look pretty or look the part on a on a <laughs> on a store shelf. <laughs> but uh, the design represents so much more than that. Right. So, how, what do you what do you think? What are some of the ways that have been um, applied or practiced to sort of like bust this misconception? It's funny. Um, I think, I think, uh, in in many ways, uh, terms like design thinking and and human centered design right. um, are sort of more popular sound bites that we do hear for organizations at least talk about or at least they express a curiosity. Right. And in many ways, um, when you when you crack open the 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 process that a let's say a typical industrial designer takes for any product or maybe even use a piece of furniture, um, there is an inherent problem solving process in their creative journey to get to that final product. And what we've learned, I think over recent decades is that you can actually, um, 
you could apply that same problem solving process of, of developing empathy for people, um, diverging and exploring the extremes of uh, what customers have an appetite for, um, you know, diverging a number of different ideas against the opportunities that you uncover and then converging on a solution. Um, that, that same creative problem solving approach can be applied to shaping digital experiences or even the business makeup them, themselves. Um, you, now, now you have designers actually shaping businesses alongside their, their strategy and marketing peers. Right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for that. So in your opinion, mm-hmm. what do you think um, needs to be applied in the human centered design thinking to solving Africa's grand challenges? Oh, that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a large question, but a very important one. Right. Um, I, I think, let me just start with a challenge. I think when we, when we speak of design thinking or human centered design, um, it's, it's really easy for the design industry in particular, and especially when we look at um, the large system that is the continent and all the systemic threads that have informed how the institutions sort of run and how people navigate to different societies across the continent. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's really easy for the design industry to sort of want to design for the constituents, the stakeholders, mm-hmm. uh, depending on wherever we are, we're looking at uh, as a topic on the continent. Um, but that design for actually could be problematic in that the industry can sort of try to solve problems from an ivory tower perspective. You know, we, we have this history in design and we're going to solve your challenges by, by designing, uh, designing for you or designing at you. And, and it, it is sort of a, a, um, a posture that can actually breed harm if we're not careful. Yeah. If we don't really understand what's happening and, and really respect and appreciate the systems that are at play, then um, whatever we design, you know, if it's the next generation digital solution, mm-hmm. uh, we may not be able to, to, to see the bias and the harm that that solution could cause if, if left unchecked. Uh, so I'm a big proponent that, um, you know, the industry definitely needs to just understand how it can design with people and actually include uh, any stakeholders that we're potentially serving in our design work, mm-hmm. uh, including them in the process, respecting their views, treating them as, um, as co-creators with us. And, that, and I think the beautiful thing is that the stakeholders that we you know, could engage as an industry on the continent, we, we then in the process of doing the work, we develop new designers that have, um, that have now uh, began to, to try their own sort of hand at the methods. And then and in many ways, they can actually make the methods that we as a design industry uphold. Um, those constituents can actually make the methods even better because they're they're more respectful. They're more tuned in to the realities on the continent. Right. So I think it, we have to be more, I guess, democratic or more um, open source in how we, with humility, serve whatever it is that we're trying to um, address and include the people that are most affected in the problem solving together. All right. So, you know, just, just in the same train of, you know, picking your mind on what you think, um, is there something that budding and established entrepreneurs should care about when it comes to design and why? Um, I think, I think ultimately the way the world is moving, the, the pace of change, how it's accelerating yeah. thanks to technology and all these forces, all the connectivity that we have, mm-hmm. it, it's really easy for a, a, a new entrepreneur uh, with a budding idea to forget how important design is in shaping whatever solution they're, they're looking to uh, conceive in the world and scale right. to new markets. Right. Uh, so I would just challenge every entrepreneur who's looking to build that early founding team is to you know, consider a design co-founder um, or, you know, get, get heavily versed, um, you know, a designer, a designer like that, that might be um, in professional standing that's looking to start a business. They should absolutely do it because they may have a, a keen eye in how the solution breeds a final sort of customer experience. Um, so just including design sensibilities in the DNA of the organization from the very start is what I highly encourage. Right. All right. Great, thanks. So here at EOU, it's common to hear somebody say we do hard things. And in that light, what would you say 
has been the most challenging aspect or have been the most challenging aspect of your career as you continue to grow and teach others in the process? Um, I, th- I think... I think a little bit of context. I, I, w- I would say, as I as I navigated, um, when I started as an engineer, that that was probably comfortable ground because I think the work sort of matched right. the things I learned in school, and 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 things were sort of um, pragmatically sort of defined, yeah. <laughs> and you could kind of navigate those rubrics with cer- some degree of certainty. Mm-hmm. So I, I I would say I felt comfortable in my skin at the early stages of my career, but. But as I moved forward, um, a multidisciplinary curiosity sort of arose. And it, I think it arose in layers. Like, you know, as an engineer, I became very curious about business. Yeah. But, but crossing the lines into the business world from engineering was not easy. And then uh, being in the Nike environment, you know, actually realizing the power that design could have and that I didn't necessarily need to leave my design, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't need to leave my engineering and business pedigrees behind that, that they could actually work together. Right. Um, it, it, it took a while to resolve how to integrate those curiosities, those volitions, mm-hmm. and to build on the skills that I needed to make this emerging vision of how I could, how I could position my career for the intersection of, of these disciplines and how it could help position me for a career in innovation moving forward. So that, that, that consternation of figuring out like that delicate balancing act across those disciplines Mm -hmm. was, was very, uh, a very important sort of phase in my career. And it was not easy in that, um, you know, I I was facing many uphill paradigms, uh, many voices telling me that I was, you know, people might've perceived that I was unfocused because I was trying to do, I was trying to wrestle with this hybridity and not picking one, one lane of opportunity. Right. But but in parallel, though, I'm, I'm looking out outside the company walls and I'm looking at the marketplace and how much the marketplace needs that, that integrated you know, thought and practice. And, not, and it's not about being all things to everyone by being a hyper generalist and never being good at one thing. Like I, <laughs> I, I'm a big believer. <laughs> I'm a big believer in breadth and depth. Right. Like from, from a breadth angle, how can we communicate and collaborate with people that are different from us in the, in the conference room? Because more and more, we're going to find ourselves in conference rooms that have different people yeah. um, that we're not used to working together before. And so we have to get used to that. And then that same multidisciplinary team that we'll find ourselves in more and more, they need to trust that each individual in that team can actually hang their hat um, and, and deliver something meaningful against their strengths. And so, you know, you do have to run deep in a, you know, one to two to three areas so that the team can actually trust that you can deliver the pieces that are necessary. So it took a while for me to, to resolve like what breadth and depth means, means for me. And over time though, you know, I, I, I had the, the, the fortunate uh, blessing to, to be a part of some runways where I got to prove out like that recipe. Right. Um, and, and it eventually informed the need to start my own company. But again, it, the, the rhyme and reason is definitely geared toward the needs that are evolving in the marketplace and the ability to help other organizations tune into how they can be more innovative and transformative with their, with their work. This podcast is brought to you by Venture by AOU, a free course for entrepreneurs. Do you want to know how to overcome entrepreneurial challenges from real life experiences? Well... Venture is an online course designed for young and aspiring entrepreneurs. It features more than 10 AOU entrepreneur leaders who will guide and inspire young entrepreneurs. You can find Venture on venture.aoueducation.com. Once again, venture.aoueducation.com. Venture, a course for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. Now back to our conversation. It's crazy that you say that because like from from what I'm just understanding from what you said is that, you know, you're trying to be a jack of multiple traits and as much as you're not necessarily a master of all of them, it's it's put you in a space that allows you to find the synergy and the chemistry between the two um, worlds that you've come from or the two worlds that you're trying to bring together in order for it to work for you. And, you know, that's how you've gotten to where you are right now. Am I wrong? 
No, that's that's exactly right. I, I, I think it, it's definitely informed even how I position the business that I run right. uh, with potential clients. It's, you know, and, and the reason why I, I express the two design disciplines of strategic design and industrial design, because I think it allows me to leverage all the faculties and all the experiences that I've had to date. Uh, on one hand, strategic design is going to help my client partners understand how I can join them in the problem solving at the strategy table right. and help them evolve how the business evolves through um, a lot a lot of you know design based problem solving methods and then based on the opportunities that we uncover um, through through the depth I can leverage the industrial design process building on my mechanical engineering background and, and the experience with physical product creation through the different chapters of career to make sure that we flesh out uh, the right, the right uh, solutions that are necessary based on those business opportunities that we uncover together. Right, right. So you recently picked up a new project. Um, I don't know if it's if it's if it's that new to you, but um, you're working on a book with the MIT Press. What learnings would you say we should expect from the book as your readers? Oh no, pr- appreciate that. Yes. Um, so honestly. The more I work with clients, big and small, so I work from a full range of, of clients like startups um, all the way to, you know, large innovation and design and brand departments of, that sit within large organizations. So, but, the, but the, need is, the need is familiar, and it's really around, like, in working with them, we see an opportunity to better codify, like, where design and innovation capabilities can actually uh, be organized and and be more strategically helpful to guide the future course of those businesses. Right. And so uh, I'm I'm arguing for a more deliberate arrangement um, to unlock multidisciplinary collaboration, which I believe is the currency that will inform where future innovation is going to need to come from. And it's not just about uh, rewiring for the here and now, right? I think do, in doing so, like we help an organization better. Um, position itself to be relevant to a changing marketplace right. because value criteria value criteria are changing all the time. And we've seen so much change recently with thanks to COVID and some of these other forces that are at play mm, yeah. um, that, that it's re- really easy for the market to slide out from under your feet if you're not careful. So um, I think these, 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 are, these capabilities that I'm arguing for can help organizations be more resilient, more market relevant. But then, but then also as, as we look forward, um, we, we definitely need to understand like how future foresight plays in, how can the things that we work on today actually actually be, be more um, aligned and, and calibrated to, um, to prove r- resilient in new future scenarios that we haven't yet encountered. And so getting organizations wired to think more about their future in the context of what they're building today right. is also helpful for them. All right. So as part of Innovation Hubs, uh, there must have been quite a number of entrepreneurs that have come your way and pitched their product as the next big thing. In your opinion, what have some of them lacked to have successful ventures and what have some of, what have some of the best had that our listeners could try and embody? That's a good, good question. Um, honestly, it, it may sound very simple, but it's extremely hard to pull off. And that, that really is the art of storytelling. Right. Uh, with, with any, with any pitch, some pitches might overly celebrate, um, overly celebrate the technology or the intellectual property that they sort of have a, a, a toehold on. And, and the tele, the technology becomes sort of the king of their, their pitch or their message. Right. And, it might be cool. It might be slick. It might be, uh, you know, faster, more powerful, better in every single way. But, uh, so sometimes the story about how that's actually going to transform someone's experience is, is, is lacking. Right. And we never, we never see a story plot for how not just the end consumer, but the different human based actors in the system are actually going to, you know, have to engage. And are we, are we pushing a solution potentially on someone or are we actually fine tuning how that solution fits into their normal everyday realities and that they almost would naturally just you know, embrace the solution if it were available to them right. and, and have them actually invent how it applies or how it fits into their day to day. So 
that's probably the biggest missing piece is just the, the, the basic art of storytelling, which is easy to say in practice, but extremely hard to get right when you're pitching. So from, from what I'm getting out of that is like, you know, um, whenever you're starting a venture or about to pitch a venture, think about the problem and see if the same reason you're trying to solve it is the same reason why um, your potential client would be interested in it. Right? Yeah, it's a, there's there's a few different lenses to that point. Right. I mean, we we could double click and say like, does the pitch the the new thing that I'm trying to sell, does it actually matter to someone? Mm -hmm. Do do we have a sense of like how this is a problem or an opportunity space, and not just like my idea in the context <laughs> of my world of how I think about that idea, yeah. but in the in the person that I'm going to potentially serve, does it matter? Right. Is it desirable to them? Um, from a from a business angle, will it help my business, my my emerging startup, actually position itself to be differentiated in the market? It, you know, so that is it is it actually business viable? Could I could I uh, garner competitive advantage? Can I earn money? Can I can I take market share based on how good the idea is? So that's is it like business viable? And then lastly, you know, the technology is important; it has to work. So does it work? Will it work? How hard is it to pull off from a feasibility? standpoint. So those, those are a few uh, lenses from a multidisciplinary sensibility that we should have. Um, and then also like for any solution as it intervenes in the normal experience of someone's life, um, how does that thing that we're creating open up new utility, like a, a new avenue of utility that they would naturally want to walk down in their normal everyday life? Is, is my solution helping someone find sort of a new path right. that they want to take right. on their terms? And then, and then in a world of big data and all this information always impinging on us, how are we parsing away the noise and serving up the information that's relevant to make someone want to walk down that new path of utility? And then lastly, like, are we doing more than just solving incremental pain points? Are we transforming how someone feels around the brand that they engage? So they, these are some opportunities that, to your point, you know, um, any, any entrepreneur should be thinking about when they, when they pose their solution to someone. Great. So you've busted a few myths. <laughs> you've told us why, you know, you from from why you transitioned from engineering into design. You have also given us advice for um, budding and established entrepreneurs. So my one question is, how do you stay ahead of the game? Uh, um, I try to stay ahead of the game through many different ways. I think I think one uh, is that I, I try to connect myself to other people that are outside my immediate realities. Right. Some people could call that mentorship. Some people can say, you know, find your professional communities. I think, I think having, having circles of friends and professionals and potentially mentors and advocates that you can go engage with outside your realities and share what, you know, you're, you're experiencing, but also learn from them and understand the best practices that they're figuring out. Right. Like, community is so important and and within that community i i've over time i've identified people that i deem that are thinking you know 20 steps ahead of me and i i follow them i follow their you know their tweets on twitter i i, I follow them on social media i consume the things that they're reading um because wherever i find sort of like-minded values I, I become very curious about like what those people are discovering and i go find and read about those resources and it it gives me ideas and, and it's very much, uh, and, and as much as I get so much from the communities that are outside my immediate world, I'm also conscious that it's important for me to, um, share what I've learned and, and also give to those communities, the things that I'm experiencing. So, um, you know, over, over time, I've, I've seen the value of, of, you know, writing articles of, of volunteering to speak, volunteering to help design community, not, not for the sake of celebrating from an egotistical standpoint, but I just, I'm just a big believer that if you share what you've learned, you sort of free your mind up to then learn new things. And it's sort of this circular <laughs> flywheel right. that keeps on going and keeps, keeps you relevant, keeps you fresh, keeps you nimble to be able to, you know, adjust and adapt to new circumstances that are in, in front of you. Right. So if that's the case, do you have any advice for people looking up to you or, you know, just any general advice for our entrepreneurial leaders listening on today? Sure. I, I would say 
um, it, it's easy for me to look back at my career with hindsight being 2020 right. and, and recommend all kinds of advice. But I'm, I'm, I'm very careful of what I recommend because my, the, the, the learnings and the experiences that I've had may not be applicable directly to someone yeah, else's experiences. Unique, yeah. But, but what I will say is when I look back, the, the defining thread that has helped me and I think can help others is that curiosity has definitely been the defining thread through every chapter of my career. Right. And then on top of that, having the courage to then experiment on those curiosities. And it could be small experiments that you do on the side, but as you, as you experiment, you're basically unearthing evidence that you can hold up for yourself as well as others to say, you know, actually there's something here to this, this curiosity and the experiments and the evidence that you create could lead you to a bigger fork in the road where now you have some, you know, key decision points to make in your career, whether to commit to a path or not. Right. Um, and, and as you experiment, it's not about, it's not about experimenting and, and, and shooting darts just for the sake of it in any direction. There's usually a conviction that's running behind the scenes that we all feel like we want to serve someone. We want to help. We want to deliver a different type of impact. Um, we see a market need that's not being addressed, like listening to those convictions and having those convictions guide where we take our curiosity, where we take our experiments. Right. I think that has worked for me. Great. Thank you so much for that, Kevin. Um, and th also thank you for taking time once again to be with us for this uh, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, I feel like there are a lot of gems that we can get out of here. And yeah, we just appreciate that you took the time to be with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to help. And that was Kevin Bethune, CCO and co-founder of Dream Design and Life. And he caps this episode by telling us to be more inquisitive. Watch out for his upcoming project with the MIT Press. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. You can find us on Spotify, Anchor and Apple Podcast for exclusive access to all the gems of knowledge that we drop here. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on your preferred platform. This is the AOU podcast, Entrepreneur Leadership in Africa. Real stories, real experiences. 